we actually started with compositions which were composed, so he used to play Strauss and Pianese music, but then we found out that we enjoy arranging music and changing it to our own style. Mm -hmm. And also we played only in three-piece band and quartet, so we wanted to make the sound as big and interesting as possible. So we invented all kinds of techniques and uh, arrangements which, where we can show everything we can do. Okay, so and that's how this program all um, was created. So actually now we play all the compositions are our own arrangements or own compositions. Okay. So basically we take the theme of classical piece or recently even of the modern songs as uh, even chat that music. Nice. Yes, yeah. yes, we, we did that and we just create the compositions based on those themes and trying to make the classical music maybe slightly more accessible okay. and that way you know creating the way of mm -hmm. maybe not being so afraid for some people of the okay. classical mm -hmm. music. It's also a little bit like a bridge you know from the classical world to the mm -hmm. pop music world and also from the other side. And how do you how do you do that? How do you bridge that? So the big bridge is the theme. If people know some melody, they enjoy it much more. It's also from psychology. You know, they know it. If you know the few notes or the rhythm, you are enjoying listening to it. So we take a theme which everyone knows from the childhood or from a movie, and we compose a piece upon it. And it's and then we use the classical music techniques and composition techniques okay. which are great <laughs> and yeah. we have a whole piece so if the music is only eight bars we can make a four minute piece That's of it. Amazing. Yeah. Any chance of a quick demonstration? Yeah, so we, we can yeah. just show a small piece, we yeah. use the piano. Okay, so without your... Um, uh, it's Adam, isn't it? Is your usual yeah. pianist, so without Adam you could give us a little short oh, demonstration, yeah. that would be, be great, thank you. Thanks guys, you're right, it's, it's definitely very accessible. A lot of beaming faces <laughs> up at you there, <laughs> that was beautiful. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about improvisation. I know, mm -hmm. Anton, that uh, that's your area and there's some recordings, very exciting recordings mm -hmm. of you um, on YouTube, improvising cadenzas as uh, Vladimir just, just steps back and uh, allows you to do your thing. Um, do you think, I, I get the, the impression that in classical music that composers shudder at the word improvisation. Do you think there is enough room in classical music for that playfulness and that Yeah, there is not anymore. There used to be. In the past all the composers, they were often also performers and they used to improvise like Mozart and Bach, mm -hmm. better when they were the best improvisers. Mm -hmm. right. But after some time, they thought maybe the performers that it's more safe to have the cadence of rhythm because it's a risk. If you, if you are on the stage and you are nervous, it's very hard to improvise. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very good. And that's why. Oh. <laughs> no, I. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I do disasters, sometimes I finish in the land of no man and I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> this is the part of it. Well, he likes to read. So, yeah. in the past, the cadences used to be improvised. So the performer also sh showed his uh, skills of improvisation mm -hmm. and then slowly the composer they started to write down the cadences and in the 20th century again people wanted to do only one thing and good not many things and not so good so performers they stopped to write music and they just concentrated on playing music and everything is written which is good for the technique mm -hmm. and they are do not doing any mistakes or mm -hmm. so but sometimes it's a little bit boring yeah. if you come to the concert you don't see his personality okay like I feel like a victim of the uh, cl classical world where from the early days as we started I, w I was always uh, told to play exactly what's in the music if I played one note somewhere away mm -hmm. like the teacher would immediately stop me like no 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 like what's written in there play that way and so on but, but and I tried to 
cross into that world, but when I was already an adult, like about 19 or 20, and that's too late. If yeah. you don't have a natural, Anton started when he was maybe 12. Okay, he so that's why he's damn. more comfortable with the and, risk. Uh, he, he just likes, I, I'm getting there, but I'm okay. a couple of steps behind that way, that I need to learn everything note by note. Even mm -hmm. if I play one note wrong in two hours concert, I generally have to stop for two bars to find myself where I am, where I continue. Wow, it's so And for really him, it doesn't matter. Like, I mean, he's always looking at me like, error, error, something is wrong, you know? Like, he's, he's taking a piss, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to say, like, his computer is full working. <laughs> memory full, you know? Yeah. But uh, I have to memorize every single note and everything. Okay. And for him, he just remembers the lines, and if something goes slightly different, he just... Wow, so that's an amazing skill to have, actually, and I'm really jealous of that. Like, my experience with music has been very similar to years and what I find the limitation of the music uh, musical education in Ireland and maybe it's the same in Slovakia we have people who maybe study music their entire lives up until 18 17 18 they go to mm -hmm. university and stop playing for a few years and now in their 30s they can't play do deer oh well you do have to study the music yeah. if you want to. but they would have studied for a long time and because of that mm -hmm. I think the problem rigidity. is that they divided the worlds so the people who play, I don't know, Irish music, they know how to improvise and they enjoy playing. And the classical world is something completely different, but it should be connected, I think. Mm -hmm. Does it bother you then if you improvise on stage and it doesn't go so well? How mm. do you deal with those mistakes? Um, we laugh always. Yeah? I mean, if it, you it, see it, a it smiling on really stage, means you know? doing I mean, mistakes. You do the cadence. <laughs> I was smiling last night. But <laughs> 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 I mean, people, they don't hear it usually. Fortunately, okay. they don't hear anything. I mean, from the cadences. Mm -hmm. So you do one wrong note, uh, my colleagues are laughing on the stage, and then we just continue. Okay, <laughs> okay, that's great. So then, to continue on on that arrangements and improvisation thread, when you're working with, you go back to Slovakia, don't you? To work with Adam. Yeah, or wherever we can. Wherever you can meet. What flies are cheaper? Okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> when you're working on a an arrangement for a new piece then are you the type of musicians that you you, you push the boat way out go go to the extreme and then bring yourselves back or are you a bit more deliberate and delicate in how you make your choices when you're working on a new arrangement so the big choice is usually the music i mean the piece of music that's mm -hmm. the first thing we have to choose theme. what is the theme which is possible to okay. be arranged then we usually make a plan on a paper and we say what would we like to have from the music. Does it have to be very modern mm -hmm. or accessible for people? And mm -hmm. Sometimes they go too far with uh, that it becomes very interesting for us. But As a classical musician. But it's so very good to ask our wives, uh, what do you think of this piece? And if we hear that it sounds very, very modern, but if it's in the way of uh, modern classical music, that it means it's all wrong. You know, okay, it's no longer like, accessible. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, and then we just take a piece and we try to play it. Adam is a great improviser. He is really? 100 times better than myself. So we just play it a few times and we are looking for possible ways. And then okay. we record sometimes also okay. the playing. And then we start to write the music to the computer. And then you s do you send those back then to, to Ireland, to, yeah. to Vladimir? To and do you, do you <laughs> so yeah, I was going to ask, do you, you sign off? Uh, then Vladimir? Well, I sort of <laughs> look, we tried, uh, no, I generally look after the production and promotion uh, the mm -hmm. other side of the mm -hmm. more business side of it. So yeah. okay. we always speak like what would work in the production, what is the next direction we should be going. And yes, I, I always get the music on the day when it's written or the day after. Mm -hmm. And then we look whether we all agree that it's good. It's a teamwork. It's not really that I would be saying, okay, like, no, this is bad no. or something. I wouldn't. <laughs> As much as he does th give That's out to me how I'm doing the business, but then we generally <laughs> know our places. <laughs> okay, well, that's a good segue in, um, into to your relationship and the dynamic, like you, uh, you market yourselves as the dueling violin brothers. But do you, um, how much does sibling, I guess, sibling rivalry, but also how when you, you know someone so well, you've grown up together and it's so natural to rub each other up the wrong way. No, we criticize each other a lot. Really? It's very important. Yeah. But it's great There is though. no filter, it's just normal. No. So <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's too much, but... Uh. So when people come to our house, it's like our youngest brother, Victor, now uh, worked with us after four years, first time. Mm. He did the orchestrations uh, for the 25-piece orchestra yesterday and it was two hours program. It was 700 pages of a3 scars with a wow. small dot so it's a lot of writing yeah. and a lot of work and he did that all and he was conducting 
And when he see uh, seen us, like how much we argue, and when we said anything to him, he goes like, "How can you work like that?" Like yeah. he's a little bit out of that world for the, some time because he's studying in Moscow at the moment, so we okay. don't see him that often. Okay. But I think he got used to it at, at the yeah, end of the week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are <laughs> teaching him how. To Getting work. more argumentative. Yeah. <laughs> and does that help then? Does that like? improve the, the speed of the process and oh, you get to move on. Yeah, maybe the quality, quickly. you know, because we are over criticized. I mean, if he plays, I'm criticizing you all the time. So he has to improve mm -hmm. and also... I'm criticizing him, but the he other way. doesn't take it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, He's the I mean, it, it's good. When I pick a piece, he says, no, no way, Irish will hate it or it's boring. And that's why if we have an idea, it has to be a really good idea. Otherwise, okay. it doesn't work. Uh, it, it, we have to filter it through many resources and then we ask people around as well and then... Okay. Hey, great. I'd like to talk to you so about your lives as musicians. So, Vladimir, how long have you been in Ireland? Uh, Again, I will be, uh, it, it's over 13 years over 13 now. Years. It's going to be 14 in September. So, um, so Vladimir has been here for okay, nearly 14 years. And for our audience, the, the guys come from a very musical family and used to play with um, their parents and their, their siblings quite a bit. But when you left, to, for, to come to Ireland, why did you want to leave your violin behind? It was very obvious in our family that we we're going to all become six siblings and all become a professional musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were sort of asked that question when we were five or six years of age. And once we decided then, you know, music lessons four times a week and you go on with it. Uh, it was a great thing what our dad did because I'm really happy now. But mm -hmm. when I became to teenage years and I was 17 or 18, I started to struggle. Uh, as I could see the classical world was changing a lot. Uh, I don't know how it was here, but back in Slovakia or Czechoslovakia before and around the musicians, classical musicians would be counted on sort of really high ranking. Like mm -hmm. we had more possibilities than, than doctors or anybody else. Like uh, right. it, it to travel and to, to travel and uh, also money would be much, much better. Uh, right. you know, even just working the orchestra and the change in the 90s that I could see happening I was like, actually, this is not what I picked to be or okay. to study. And I wasn't that much in love with the classical music as yet. And I discovered Eminem and all sorts of other uh, performers. And uh, I said, I want to try something different. Okay. So I just wanted to leave everything behind and go for a couple of months. I only plan to stay for Fe two for and a half, months. three months. Yeah. And then Antho was actually given out to me to take the violin because I, had, uh, I haven't had a single word in English. Okay, so right. I just he had one word, but I can't say which one. <laughs> <laughs> so, Fair enough. <laughs> can use our imaginations. Yeah, I was listening to Eminem, and my mom was saying, oh, so what are you listening to? And I couldn't understand a word, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. So then you got to Ireland, and in a few days, and uh, you're in the West for a while, isn't that uh, right? I wanted to go, but when I came to Dublin, I see the reality how it is and okay. how much everything costs. Back so then, the difference was very different. I, I brought 600 euros and I thought I'm going to survive a month. <laughs> and, uh, Evil laugh. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. And back then it would be possible in Slovakia. Now it's all sort of equalizing, but you know, okay. 14 years ago. So I came in and then I realized, okay, so I would need to take a flight in two weeks' time or call my dad for money. Mm, wow. And okay. uh, I didn't want to do that. So I yeah. said, like, I, I want to try something different and I want to create something. So I said, like, okay, it's just for some time I'm going to Bosk. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that uh, I can get really really quick direct impact of what I'm doing from people. Okay. So for example, you are playing a piece of music that you thought everybody's going to love or, or I love, mm -hmm. but no, you don't make a cent. Okay. And then you play something else and you just start seeing that people are interested. Mm -hmm. So it was a really good tester for the market. Oh, that's and great. That actually found the pieces that I enjoy and people enjoy. Yeah. So then I uh, created the first band and it was great times in 2005 and six. We sold over 20,000 CDs only on the street wow. of Dublin, yeah. and it was going really, really well. Uh -huh. But then I wanted to move it over somewhere farther. Okay. But the musicians I had back then, they were really happy that, okay, we are making great money here mm -hmm. on the street. Like, why would we uh, risk something? Why would we try to, you know, bring it somewhere else? Mm -hmm. And then for another 12 years, I'm working on something that hopefully we can bring internationally next year. Okay. So, so real live market research uh, yeah. with the. Uh, the shoppers on Grafton Street. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was a really good start, yeah. you know. Yeah. But I mean, uh, within a year and a half, I was starting to I started to organize concerts with different promoters and so on right. until I 
Who was the first promoter then that you would have, or who was the first person to put you on stage? Uh, it was Jim Malloy, it was actually a very local promoter, he's yeah. more like a, he retired and he did it as a hobby. Uh, oh, okay. He actually came to concert last night, oh, he's about lovely. 85 or 88, something like he's very yeah. old now. Uh, but then sort of Mr. Business as I call it was Pat Egan who would be the main classical okay. crossover promoter in mm -hmm. Ireland and then I worked with uh, Rubyverse which is the record company and th they're part of MCD so oh, right, okay. so that way and at the moment we said about a year ago or so that we actually need to drop everyone everything and start sort of throw ourselves to the water okay. and uh, see what's possible because it was struggling for a while it wasn't moving anywhere Oh, drop the promoters that yeah, you're yeah. working with. Okay. And uh, agent and mm -hmm. manager and record company. Mm -hmm. and wow. It's a lot of different uh, people to be involved if you want to get it somewhere. But yeah. uh, we felt that all those people were great and really enjoyed working with mm -hmm. them. I was with the record company for seven years. Yeah. But uh, it, you know, we hit the brick wall. Okay. Where it actually wasn't going anywhere. So and I thought I have on. an idea, and we have an idea as where to work. Mm -hmm. And I think we're getting quite good results now. Uh, with the production package from yeah. yesterday, I think yeah, really, absolutely. really good, and we did more work within a couple of months than we had done in a long time. Okay, before. that's amazing. When did you join then, Anton? It was like about like I always played with him, or during my studies, I always came here to Ireland in summer to play weddings and things, so okay. I could pay all my studies through the years. But actively, about four years ago, okay, it was the first concert in the concert hall with him and. Mm. Wow, that's great. So you're based in Switzerland, yep. isn't it? Right. And you, we, we established this earlier, you have actually finished all <laughs> yes. of your masters now. You know, decided yeah. you're not doing any more masters. Yeah, it's enough. Now I have to <laughs> live the real life. Okay, that's great. So the, the package uh, that you're talking about, the performance package that you've been working on over the last year or so, I guess, so, yeah, yeah. and that we, we got to see last night, what's, what are your hopes and aspirations for that? Like what's next with that package? We have to... First of all, we have to create the package, which will take about a month. We have to take highlights. We have to take mm -hmm. uh, the orchestrations and you know have it all prepared as one package. We're hoping to forward it onto different orchestras and circles, likes of BBC, and just offer that this is what we have. We have they have to see that the work of the orchestration is good, the music choice is right. Mm -hmm. and they have to see the examples of how we play, how it can look on the stage, and so on. So that would be one, and secondary, we would like to prepare, and that those were the ideas about the more sort of recent songs mm -hmm. rather yeah. than uh, doing everything only classical. We need some sort of tune that will break us through into different markets, and for mm -hmm. example, America would need something the more modern, mo more modern but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean we have to play it all the time, it, uh, like through the whole concert, but yeah. you need to have a couple of those themes that people actually like like bonuses. can latch on yeah, to. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. And then when you... So just st uh, to sell it and probably get, we have a couple of different people highlighted that we would like to work with as managers, okay. as an agents, and then also as the producers. But at the moment, we're all in the process of research because you don't want to just jump into it because we feel that we do have the product That's great. that we could go. And will forward. your younger brother uh, continue to do your orchestrations? Or does you, when you go to work with a, an orchestra like the BBC Orchestra yeah. or the RT Orchestra, does that conductor, do, do you work with that conductor? Or can you also bring in your own uh, conductor? We, we would like to have him on the list uh, as a part of the production package, okay. but sometimes they want to have their own conductors or they have a conductor that, can, that sells the tickets as well. Sure. Uh, for example, if they did, uh, we did half of the concert or so on, they had something else. So he will be definitely part of the production package and it's really good to work with him actually. We enjoyed it. And He's also a peacemaker by the sounds of it. <laughs> uh, not exactly, I wouldn't call it that way, but uh, no, he, he really can hold the orchestra well. Yeah. It's the old Russian school where they actually show every single bit and mm. Right. To every player, rather it than just yesterday, that was a test actually for him. He didn't know it. <laughs> uh, so you keep him. <laughs> yeah. What is really hard for classical orchestras, and we found it with some of the BBC uh, orchestras as well. They're not used to play uh, sometimes as fast as we go with the tempos. Uh, we call it test time. I don't know how it's in English. Like when you go fast, nt, 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 and they're just not quick enough to follow uh, uh. because they don't have the monitors. Generally, so they're like. W double bass is somewhere there, mm -hmm. and the violas will be on the other side of the hall, and they mm -hmm. have to go, <laughs> and, once, uh, and until the sound comes, it's already too late. So they actually wow. have to ignore the sound, but they have to only follow the conductor. Wow, okay. And uh, it will be more taken from the folk music, the, these techniques. Nice. And 
that's where actually it was real test that it works for Victor and he mm -hmm. was able to hold it together. That's amazing. Yeah, he definitely held it together. Yeah, yeah. And then it's we, also good because we could, well. we could talk to him at home and prepare every, mm -hmm. everything. And yeah. You know, so if you have a we, professional conductor, you meet him 10 minutes before the rehearsal mm -hmm. and then it is mm -hmm. not enough time probably. Okay. okay. I mean, it would work. Yeah. They will sometimes <laughs> underestimate uh, how difficult what, it what can What the expectations come, are as uh, well. Yeah, yeah that's um, fair enough. Um, so you both have very busy lives by the sounds of it and we've talked a little bit about your lives over over lunch can you tell us about like how, how do you how do you manage that you you're a musician you're a promoter but you were also a student your parents how do you juggle those that lifestyle <laughs> Mine is not so Don't difficult. Know. <laughs> for me the difficulty was the studies and playing concerts so I always had to organize also with the teachers at school and professors because it's very risky. Mm -hmm. Either they are happy that you play the concerts or they say you shouldn't study if you want to do your career now. Okay. So it was a real struggle for all these years. I had to organize and write letters to school to right. let me go for months there, for months there. And were most of your professors like, forthcoming and, and happy with you to go and perform or did you have some who were a bit more... They were all happy actually. Okay. Because the, the last school was very good. But last school, it, it's not even the professors. I mean, your violin professor, they don't care. They are happy if you play concerts. Mm -hmm. It's more about the um, headmaster of the school and music theory teachers and this. Mm -hmm. And so you've got the balancing, the, all the, the family life, the, the touring, performing, and then marketing and promoting as well. But you're, you're running a small business, really. So It, it is sort of a like. small business. Uh, so it can be very hard, mm -hmm. and uh, it is very in the relationship. It can be quite difficult as well. Like in the last three weeks, uh, I seen my wife and kids for total of twenty minutes, okay. and for a week they actually had to even get out of the house, and okay. they went for <laughs> holiday. Leave you alone. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I mean, it is really much that you start working at seven in the morning and you finish at one a.m. Mm -hmm. and you just have to go with it because that's what you are doing. At the moment I like to do, and it's a bit of my own fault, uh, I like to be in charge of too many things maybe, so I promote, I, I do stage managing, I do library, and I do, uh, I mean everything for the music and uh, promotions yeah. and then production wise and so on. But obviously, as I said, we're highlighting different people for that, so I yeah. would be hoping to actually become a violinist, which is <laughs> only about 10% of my uh, or job 20 these percent days. Uh, job these days, and I still need to spend about four hours a day with it, so uh, that okay. would be. Okay, yeah. Um, we're going to go to audience questions uh, in, in a little while, so have a, have a think about something you'd like to ask the guys. Um, I was chatting to Hugo, one of our volunteers yesterday, and um, I read some questions. He was wondering um, if you could, could you describe your most memorable performance, good or bad, mm -hmm. but, you know, most memorable? Uh, I would say BBC Proms. Yeah, last, a, year? Was uh, last year? A year and a half ago. Yeah. It was a really big concert because it, there were 12,000 people, and it was very special for us, yeah. big surprise. That was in Belfast, was it? Yeah. yeah. And what did you perform? Uh, about six. I don't even know which shows, but I, I, well, I want to remember that uh, because we're the only one being broadcasted to the main BBC uh, TV or whatever. Yeah. There was uh, Kalinka was picked. It was one of yeah. the Russian tunes, so okay. that went well. Yeah. That went well. Uh, only the interview actually we spoke after we played. That's and I, the I most was memorable so actually. I, I was so concentrated on the music that. Uh, the moderator, the presenter, she was asking something and I, I totally forgot to listen to her, so I was like... <laughs> and we were live me? there and she asked him something and he uh, looked at her like, did you ask me anything? You know? <laughs> First I even didn't hear the question and I was like, excuse me, then she repeated, I didn't hear what she repeated. Oh, no. It was a disaster. <laughs> oh, that's fair enough. Yeah, you need to focus on two yeah. things. Now sometimes. it wouldn't happen, I'm, I'm used to it. <laughs> that's good. I hope. <laughs> You're doing good so far. Yeah. <laughs> um, is it the same for you? Is that your most memorable performance, Vladimir? Or? Well, with the two of us, probably, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and as a solo artist? Solo artist, uh, a bad way, what I remember generally, if you get a flu or something during the... Which have, uh, it used to happen to me before I run the series of Christmas concerts, mm. where I bring more, more family members, and I used to do like 15 concerts in December, one after another. Yeah. And it was about two or three, uh, maybe three years ago, uh, I felt really like tired, like I'm not managing it. And 
I don't know what's happening, but I was just sleeping through the days, whatever. I could speak pro properly, and I was actually presenting those shows and leading mm. the orchestra, and our conductor, and uh, all those things. Yeah. And I remember I just didn't know. I one concert was I didn't remember how wow. I got on the stage and how I got off the stage. But I mean, the next year we still sold the tickets, so I guess I did something <laughs> right. Uh, or it was uh, entertaining in some and form. And we finished about the twenty-first of December, and we were doing one event in Lauperstown on the 29th, I think, or something like that, of December. And my wife was saying, like, just, you know, you should go and check with the doctor. And I said, like, I'm, I'm completely fine now. There is nothing wrong with me. Like, I feel great. Yeah. And she was pushing at me so much that I said, okay, I'm going to go to GP. And she put the whatever on my finger, the ch checking the oxygen, whatever. Yeah. And she looked at me, like, how are you standing? <laughs> and I had really strong pneumonia and everything oh else God. together okay. so, and I played those concerts with it and I was actually already fine that that was fine but you cannot uh, be sick yeah. that's one difficult thing about yeah. musicians right. that you just have to keep going so those will be the, be the ones but you have to learn then how to not being run down too much yeah you know? yeah because the show must go on yeah, yeah yeah and now I didn't get sick for the last three years or so since then I never got sick for okay. the concert uh, and also I know when we finish something like a big tour I need 24 hours of no emails, no phone calls, mm -hmm. nothing. Just sort of sit back in the garden or in the room or something, not yeah. to talk to anyone. Okay. And then I can. I wasn't sick for Christmas. Okay. Uh, for so you're three managing us. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. And before it was seven years, you know, Christmas came and I went. <laughs> but after the concerts, generally, and then once it hit me. Before. Okay. We're glad you're managing it. So that's, yeah, that's, so, so that, that's the most <laughs> memorable when you are sick, you know. But. <laughs> Back then, when I was on the streets, Jim Molloy brought me to Carnegie Hall once. Uh, that was, I think, 2006 or seven. I don't even know now yet. That was many, 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 many years ago. So I remember that was a huge occasion yeah. for me. Back then, oh, so that's as amazing. it would be for any, any yeah, musician, for any musician. Yeah, very impressive. So, do we have any uh, anyone in the audience with a burning question? We've uh, a question over here. We'll just very nice to meet you. And thank you for coming in today. I wanted to know um, if you performed, presumably, with many other artists over the years. Do you, do you find a different connection when you're playing with each other? And does that make the music more magic? Does you find it easier to perform with each other as opposed to performing with somebody who's not a relative? Yeah, it depends who you perform with. You know, if you are with a super musician, it's very easy to play even without rehearsal. But of course, when we play for so many years, we know how we move, we know how to show things, so it, it works much easier. Because everyone has his uh, body language, for example. So if you don't know the language, it's sometimes hard to be together. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important thing if you play music, to be together in time. Otherwise, it doesn't sound right. No, th there is another body language, as you said. Like, we know when we look at each other, uh, sometimes we don't have to say what bar we are trying from, because we already know where was the mistake. As mm -hmm. if you're with other musicians, he would actually not even say that there was any mistake. He would yeah. know it was fine. Now, if it was. Okay. Him and you just have to try it again. So it is much quicker pro uh, pro progress. And as we spoke before, it was to do also with being able to crit criticize each other. Yeah, so because if well. you are with someone, you see for the first time, you can't tell him you are out of tune, you are not good, because they would just go away or hate you. And never work <laughs> with you again. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's so nice with him. I can tell him anything. I think. <laughs> hey, that's great. <laughs> Thanks, Dean. Um, any other questions in the room? Um, I had a little question about your childhood. If you, if, uh, do you think that if you didn't grow up in a musical family, you would still be where you are today? Uh, it's very hard to say. I wanted to be a football player, actually. When I was 9, 10, my father said to me, OK, you can do it. Uh, but he was not happy. I knew it. And he also took my violin. He said, OK, you don't want to play violin, so don't play. And after a week, I came back that I want my violin. So then I play, I always play football uh, and also for the villages, but as a hobby. So I, I don't know, maybe I would do some other job, but sport or music would be the preference. Mm, that's great. Um, on that note, actually, so Anton, if you had left, Vladimir, sorry, if you had left your violin, Slovakia, all those years ago, what would you have done if you hadn't been called I, dad? Well, I. Stuck it out. Truck driver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? <laughs> I would, uh, I always loved nature, and mm -hmm. but also to do something with nature. Uh, I always wanted to do business as well. Okay. So I was even thinking I will go and try to do some sort of fisherman business or something like that. Okay. Like it, it could easily be going that yeah. direction a little bit, but uh, 
when I look at it now, I would still, I mean, get a violin here for 100 euros, you know, to, to, to get by for some time and then obviously probably fly and take my own violin. Yeah, but if we were not brought up and not, not uh, if we didn't grow up in the musical family, it's very hard to say because you, you generally, I think, I, I feel in this sort of whether it's a business, uh, whether it's a sport or it, whether it's music, do, some of those professions would be passed on from the yeah. generations mm -hmm. and there is generally one black sheep going somewhere sideways, which <laughs> I was nearly there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you wore that cross for the others. There's going to be lots of other questions, I think, in the... Hey, um, the program we're playing at the moment is quite eclectic and I never thought I'd hear Danny Boy being sung by the audience of the National Concert Hall, but um, what songs did you try to arrange and just reject it because you didn't think they worked? <laughs> <laughs> there was uh, one ABBA. <laughs> there was few. We did very unknown song by... What was it? ABBA. No. How which one? Um, okay, I forgot that one. We can talk about other ones. <coughs> we did Ten San Dance Macabre last year. And we loved the music. And we played it on the shows, but people were clapping somehow. Not really enthusiastic. <laughs> so we, had <laughs> <laughs> we decided to keep the peace for the future. <laughs> and, and then... No, was it ABBA? The yeah, the Marionette. Yeah. Marionette. There was a song by ABBA, we loved it and it was so modern. And and there, there was, was a lot, lot of, of different bar counts and, and jazzy like things. Really but again, people were not really reacting, so <laughs> we recorded it, we have it at home, we can listen to it. But <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there were ones that you didn't, you actually brought it right to the stage yeah, to, to yeah. a yes. performance and then decided, oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it is okay when you have, you know, 20, 22 songs during one show, mm -hmm. so you can throw in a few new ones and see, like, how people are going to react to this, so you do test every, every time. And it's sometimes also hard for us, you know, musicians, because we heard so, many, so much music and so much contemporary music that somehow we don't know sometimes what's contemporary for people. So what we thought was actually really understandable was not understandable for okay. the majority. Hi, uh, yeah. Um, I'm a hundred questions for you about stuff. So, uh, I think Iona and I have Shane Quartet, and we do a ton of weddings, and there are always a few things we get asked to play that we just hate. Um, and a few which are really unusual, so we were asked to play um, Radiohead's No Surprises, Down the Isle, for one bride. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering, are there any pieces that you guys just really hate playing, but you know that you have to do them because they're crap? <laughs> During the show, I don't think we do any of those. Now we don't have any more. Before, when I played his shows, as a second violinist. <laughs> <laughs> I always had two or three pieces I liked. The, the rest I was just suffering there. <laughs> and now, I actually, I don't have anything I don't like in the show. No, we, we do filter everything that we actually enjoy. So the, but the only thing sometimes happens that the audience don't enjoy it. Uh, 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 but we have to eliminate mm -hmm. those and find something yeah. else that we like. And also the way you put the tunes in the order, sometimes something mm. can really work well yeah. and everybody loves it, but the, if that tune went after the different song, yeah. it just wouldn't work at all. Yeah, the energy's But uh, then uh, I used to play a lot of weddings in Ireland and that was the biggest offer, I think, for us yeah. both. Because we <laughs> played the same program every week and or we shouldn't or even say what we hate because most of the people, they love these songs, so... <laughs> no, we shouldn't say. No, no, we can't say it too. <laughs> but, but with weddings, it's the same, no, it, the same it songs is, uh, every I, single I week. I did overdo yeah. it, like I used to do over 200 events a year in Ireland. Wow, okay. So I actually did reach the uh, top of what you could possibly do mm -hmm. in a country of four and a half million people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Split at everyone's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would be surprised. But, uh, yeah. I did you not. play at your own wedding? Me? Yeah. No, he did. I played. Did you, you play it? And did you play it then for... No, I didn't ask him. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I, I had a very small wedding, nobody was playing, nobody was singing. And he didn't allow anyone and to have speeches. Nobody was dancing. No, no speeches no or speeches, anything. No. This was my wife, she didn't want any speeches. No, he didn't want. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, I'll, uh, I'll, make, I'll have you play at my wedding. So I'll, I'll book you in now. I'll give you a We only do eventually. about five or six weddings a year now. Okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I can <laughs> you will fit have in one. there. <laughs> <laughs> only one, yeah? Only, only one, <laughs> only one wedding. Um, yeah, that's the plan. Anyway, <laughs> have another, uh, have another audience question. Right at the other side of the room. Myself, I started playing piano at the age of eight. Uh, I come from, be it not quite as musical as your family, but between the five of us, there's also some thirteen instruments going around, and. Um, my parents really pushed for me to pick up an instrument and we had a piano at home and I started playing the piano. But 
Uh, it's probably also because of a sheer lack of talent uh, that after kind of seven or eight years of intensive piano playing, I kind of gave up on it. And in retrospect, it took me about you know another 15 years to now start missing it. Yeah. And I figured that if I started missing it a little bit sooner, I would have probably picked it up again. So when you look at your future and potential kids and, and whatnot, could you, do you have any advice of how you would keep your kids motivated playing music and picking up an instrument and such? I think the first thing is that they have to, like if they have musical lessons, it should be a treat, not a punishment, you know? So I, I wouldn't start too soon because if they start with five, if they are not from the musical families, Sometimes they are really happy for one month and then they just get bored and they don't like it anymore. And for example, I have a son and he, he wanted to play guitar, but he was waiting for a year, for one year to have the lessons and now he has lessons and he thinks it's a special thing for him that, that he has the paid lessons and he's enjoying so much. He doesn't practice too much and I'm not pushing on him because otherwise, again, he could think it's a work and not a nice thing. So now he's practicing only when he wants, and may maybe after one year I can tell him, look, if you practice, you will enjoy more because you can play more songs, and that way probably he will stay motivated. Mm -hmm. Valerie, did your daughter sing at one of your concerts? Uh, she did concerts? Uh, last year. Yeah, yeah at yeah. the Christmas concerts. Yeah. Was it? No, uh, she liked to be part of the gang. It's my oldest daughter, and uh, since she was maybe three years of age, she said, like, I want to go with you. So I brought her to one of the local concerts. Oh, in, and it was in Trimcastle Hotel, like about 500 people. And she had no problem coming in and sing on, uh, I think, Jingle Bells or oh, okay. something like that. And actually now, after many years, uh, she composed her own version of Jingle Bells. And it was like there was a proper rap song in the middle of Jingle Bells. <laughs> She's 11. <laughs> so She's going to take over the world, it's amazing. <laughs> and she, she did her own words, everything and the melody, yeah. and she had a proper car was going there with everyone with her, you Actions know, and so on. Yeah. Wow. But uh, she played piano for a few years and now she wants to actually pick up the violin. I'm also not pushing because I feel that if she wants to really, like with a violin, it's really the latest stage she could poss possibly start to actually yeah. become a violinist because mm -hmm. it's very unnatural natural position to play. So if you start on your fully adult, it's very it's unlikely nice. that you're going to be an actual player mm -hmm. because your muscles grow a different way. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, uh, but now she's still at the age where, where she got and she really loves it and she, I taught violin for about six months or about a year in Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, I just thought I want to try the same experience. I suffered quite a lot uh, <laughs> and so I'm not teaching, but she did the progress in one month more than most of the students that I had in a year. Mm -hmm. So. I think she could do something, but again, it's completely up to her and uh, hey. she has to see if she likes the yeah. life of what I do and sometimes mm -hmm. the, the way that there is no time at all, for example, yeah. for a month, I try to be with them all the time, mm -hmm. but uh, she, she can see that. But on the other side, sometimes we have loads of time. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm not uh, at home for uh, four weeks, but then I'm there for a few weeks mm -hmm. and I'm 24 hours at home, so yeah. I like it actually. Yeah, that's great. That's a good question. Um, another question here at the front of the room. Um, yeah, great. I also play the viola. Oh, oh so many musicians. <laughs> I'm a musician at 16, so um, I did like play with concerts. So I'm, I'm actually still practicing because I picked it up when I actually really wanted to like learn it. Mm -hmm. uh, but so it's amazing and inspiring to see all this. Uh, so my question is first, like a quick question. I was curious, like, why did you choose to go to Ireland? Like, what was it that kind of drove you to like pick that ticket to Ireland? Uh, it was real coincidence. Uh, one of my cousins was here for the summer, and yeah. she actually was somewhere in Kerry or somewhere in the uh, yeah. or Clare. So I don't even know. Uh, I don't remember what it was. And okay. she showed me a few pictures, and I said, "Oh, that looks cool." I took a backpack with fishing rod and tent, and I arrived to city center of Dublin. You know. So. <laughs> 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 and, um, my other question is like, um, like for example, if you take uh, Nietzsche as a philosopher, um, he looks at like back as in um, kind of dismissing his music as in numbing the nerves of, of society. So I was kind of interested in your philosophy of what music brings to people's lives and what like the meaning is of, of music for you when you play. Mm -hmm. Like w with Wagner, I used to hate him because he was very arrogant and so, but now after I played 
few of his pieces you know, in the orchestra. He, he was a genius, so he was really good. And only after years playing with him, and so now I actually understood that it's very nice when you play concerts, that people react, they are happy, and they, they can cry on the concert. It's like in Greece, they said it was like a cure, medical cure, if you went to the drama, to theater. So you, you could leave your emotions without doing anything wrong. I mean, you can cry without Think being judged. Like it's not me, it's a musician. You can be happy. You can or you can laugh happy. without being drunk or anything. Yeah. Hey, that's great. Um, that just brings me on to, to another question. Um, yesterday you played Sunflower? From, from the, is it called Sunflower? But it's from the movie Sunflower. Sunflower yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and it's a very emotive piece. Yeah. Um, do you have... Do you have a, a favorite um, movie score, either of you, or is that an area that you'd like to oh, delve many. into sometime? Actually, when I watch movies, or I'm looking sometimes for movies, I just put on the movie and I listen to the soundtrack. And if the soundtrack is good, probably the movie is going to be good. It's always all connected. Mm. It so is. All the big because movies, the big movies will have really good soundtracks, yeah. and there will be real composers working on it. And uh, if you put them, you hear something really different. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know that this movie, okay. And you know. Also, I mean, you have uh, Godfather soundtrack, no, God, Godfather Schindler's Godfather. List. You have yeah. so many movies which are w have great soundtracks, which are played also at the concerts. Okay. So, so do you think you'll start bringing in more songs like Sunflower into your concerts? Uh, we may. We already mm -hmm. used. We may. We also did also like my favorite would be Godfather, just even the way that they connected the movie with the soundtrack. I know it's a very old movie now yeah. at this stage, but if you sort of think musically and you see the scenes and everything else, it really reflects the whole okay. scene and everything. Yeah, so hey, yeah, it's lovely. yeah good question. Uh, we probably have time for one more audience question. Um, yeah, I have a question about like the awkward relationships you encounter in the music business. So like when you decided to leave your last booking agent, or say if you are approached by a songwriter and you don't want to write with that person, has it ever become really awkward? Like, do you have any juicy stories about it? He's actually very good in social uh, relationships. I, I sometimes am much more emotive, so I would like to argue or prove someone wrong, but he always say, no, leave it, you can't burn the bridges and all these things. So we I actually never burn bridges with anyone uh, directly, so I, I deal with that side. <laughs> uh, <laughs> send, send Anton away. So have actually, all, all the people we worked with, we have a good relationship still, and there are no problems at all. So we're, uh, we're almost out of time, so I'd like to ask you one more question, and then we might close with a little performance. I've taken this question from the producer's perspective, uh, adapted it from there. It's a great podcast that I enjoy. And I'll ask both of you. So if you could be granted one wish, what would you do to, what would your wish be to change the, the classical musical scene? What would you want to change to fix the classical or to improve? Yeah. Or even say the life of a musician. Mm -hmm. If you could have one wish, something it's that It's very hard to that. say because mm -hmm. it's not that straightforward. Uh, for example, classical music was really supported back in the day uh, in the Soviet Union and so on. But again, whether that's very correct way, you cannot say in this side of the world it's actually very commercial. You either sell or you don't. Mm -hmm. You know. So for it to but be more supported. It has a good, good, you know. Things. Both of them have, you know. So it's very hard to say what would you change. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. uh, people could be brought up and that's what we are trying to do and change that we use the really accessible teams and try to create valuable classical mm -hmm. pieces or not fully classical but using the classical techniques so I think that's yeah. I, I would say less competitions like the because uh, classical musicians they have competitions and I think that's what destroyed a little bit Okay. The music, because and when you play comp competition, you have to be perfect. Yes. And it doesn't matter if you are musical sometimes or if you are original. Also, my professor, he always used to say to me, look how you play, I love it, it's great, but if you go to competition, they will kick you from the first round. Mm -hmm. And I don't like this because it should be interesting for people, yeah. it shouldn't be perfect. We can have robots who can play it perfectly. Yeah, so that's, that's great. That would be one thing, that mm -hmm. people would have more space to 
create their yeah. own interpretation. Hey, that's brilliant. Lovely. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you. And um, you're going to play us out. What are you going to play a little yeah. bit for us? Just a very small song by Pink. This was one of the trials for the America. Excellent. <laughs> the American <laughs> trial. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 